So welcome to the second meeting of this seminar series by the project Guest XR and Frontiers in Virtual Reality. The overall seminar series is called Striving for Social Harmony in XR. And just to put this in context for a second, um, the idea of Guest XR is to introduce virtual agents, machine learning based agents into virtual meetings in order to put them in a good course to realize their objectives. So this involves machine learning, obviously XR and so on. And, and, and today's talk is going to be here in the pipeline of Guest XR, which is the neuroscience, social neuroscience aspect, because the machine learning needs to have many examples of uh, how social interaction operates from which it can build up a database and the social modeling and also the neuroscience is part of that. So I'm very happy to introduce today Professor Beatrice de Gelder from University of Maastricht, who leads this part of the work on the social neuroscience and emotional recognition and so on. And Professor Beatrice de Gelder, de Gelder has degrees in philosophy and psychology. And she's also, I would say, a leading neuroscientist today with uh, currently holding uh, a, a European research grants. She, her work is in non-conscious recognition in patients with cortical damage, emotional expression in whole bodies, face recognition and its deficits, and multisensory perception and the interaction between auditory and visual processes. So she's leading this work in guest XR. And now I turn over to Beatrice to continue the talk. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks very well. Thanks very much, Mel. Um, you uh, did not mention as part of my more recent activities that uh, we have collaborated together. And my first work in virtual reality was in collaboration. First and subsequent was in collaboration with you and, uh, and Professor Sanchez. So I'm very... Uh, happy to uh this is uh i'll start off by showing you a, a video clip we used in a, in an uh, experiment uh, before virtual reality was available and what we did is have actors uh, play out this um, situation where uh, uh one person it happens to be a man, as often is, uh, tries to pull at the handbag in either at the handbag of the woman in either a playful or an aggressive uh, uh, fashion. And we did brain imaging with that and behavioral work. And people are extremely uh, uh, skillful at distinguishing between a teasing and a threatening and a threatening uh, interaction, right? Um, that's the kind of work that one would have to re would have to repeat in virtual reality sooner or later. So, um, just a little bit of background. Most of the work in my lab, the last the last few years, has been on this perception of bodies, either either bodies in, uh, single bodies or bodies in interaction, because uh, the body is actually studied much less, uh, uh, incomparably uh, less than the face. But like the face, the body is of course a rich and a powerful tool of social interaction. I mean, our social interactions would be fairly limited if they would be uh, if they would be uh, if they would only consist of uh, facial expressions and some gaze direction. Uh, also, and importantly, uh, the body carries direct, in, direct uh, information that is relevant for, uh, for uh, how can I get rid of you? Yes, uh, the body carries uh, information that is directly relevant for emotions, intentions, and actions, which we, we cannot or cannot very uh, unambiguously read from the face, right? So, uh, Understanding body perception and social interaction, if we want to know how the brain does it, we have to do it in naturalistic situations. Because uh, on the one hand, people operate function in naturalistic situations. On the other hand, the brain, which we try to understand, was built, was shaped, was designed uh, in uh, naturalistic situations. And many of those situations involve interactions with conspecifics. So, if you relate that to virtual reality, to which we will come now, now soon, uh, this the brain is the brain is shaped by the interactions of the body and the world, 
And if we want to successfully use virtual, rea virtual re reality for all sorts of reasons, then we have to take it, then we, uh, then we uh, better take into account these, these ways in which the brain is fit for social interactions, among others by recognizing the body of conspecifics. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, something is not working. Ah, okay. In previous in previous work, uh, which we initiated, uh, which initiated our, our work with virtual reality, we actually adapted um, um, a virtual reality study from from the from Mel's and uh, and Mavi's lab, where. Uh, the, the, the situation people are getting getting to see is a situation of, of domestic uh, domestic violence. So it's a, it's a, it's a situation of, of threat, of aggression, of potential aggression, or of increasing increasingly aggressive interaction. And uh, as you understand, it is those situations are important. They are important in daily life, but they are very difficult to study uh, in realistic situations because uh, these the dynamics are difficult to investigate uh, experimentally for all sorts of reasons. From going from ethical to methodological, methodological being that uh, that uh, we need a lot of repetitions when we use our techniques. Um, <coughs> ethical, of course, at the other extreme of the difficulties because it's a little bit difficult. To, to initiate uh, um, aggression and in this case domestic violence just for a purpose of, to trigger it just for the purpose of the experiment right so we uh, we use this scenario in 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 the scanner what you see there is a person laying in the scanner with uh, um, MRI compatible goggles on they don't look perfect there that these are not the ones we use we have we use better ones but still and we had uh, we the participants had this con continuous continuous scenario uh, shown to them in vr uh, in, in in the scanner we had two conditions which is important for for the topic of interaction also we had what is called a third person session where you just observe what's going on we had in contrast we had a one person one uh, first person session where you're actually uh, one of the participants and the, if it is the first person is of course the condition where you simulate where you try to approximate a real interaction because you actually get pre, prior to the scanning you get embodied in one of the characters in the interaction you're embodied as the person that undergoes the aggression from that main character we uh, we did observe. I mean, this is work from that started uh, a good five years ago. We um, <laughs> we did indeed find that in virtual reality, in this somewhat uh, somewhat unlikely environment of the scanner, we still could observe a, uh, <laughs> a, tra a social threat perception network, which was known from the literature and also from the animal literature where those things could, could have been studied uh, pre uh, much easier than previously. So that was for, for the, in retrospect, that may not strike you as, uh, as a big surprise, but uh, uh, given, uh, given uh, all the constraints of experiencing something like real aggression, in this scanner environment, in this limited and constraining uh, technical environment, etc., is uh, is still important. And of course, you can relate that to uh, the fact that uh, what's happening in virtual reality is what some, so what many people have called a sort of suspension of disbelief. You suspend your disbelief in the reality, and it's important for people working on interaction and affective processes to see that with the use of virtual reality, this suspension of this belief can actually be used to your advantage because you are actually interested in <laughs> in the very in the early and automatic processes of threat reaction to uh, uh, also um, we also found interestingly that there was a difference between males and females uh, in uh, in uh, the in the first person versus the third person condition uh, which uh, is an important lead to follow in later work um, and that difference had to do with the, among other things, with the distance between the aggressor and the victim. And that again also for us was, an, was, a, was at that time a remarkable surprise that uh, you can actually recreate 
in this artificial, very artificial and constrained environment, you can actually recreate things that are known from the animal literature, among others, on the role of uh, personal space. <laughs> if uh, and I will that will be an important uh, important uh, topic of, of the, the next studies I will present. So in this this was just background for the, for uh, for all the work. Uh, I'm now going to present you a couple of studies that are very recent. There's actually two of them just were published. The other one is not yet uh, submitted, but I'll talk about it anyway. Uh, and they all concern uh, social interactions and social interactions uh, where uh, there is a, there is a, a factor of factor of threat present. Okay, and they, all of them look at the importance of threat uh, in relation to your the distance from them from the source of threat. So how close is the threatening person? To you, how do you react as a function of the of the threat of the person being threatened? And again, uh, uh, I am needless to point out, but I do it anyway, that uh, none of these studies can actually. We want those studies to be to be naturalistic, but none of them can actually be done if we do if we would not have uh, virtual reality and methods available. So that's this. Uh, uh, a first study I'm going to talk about is a social threat and the social salience uh, uh, per peripersonal space. If you go to the older literature about proxemics and about, uh, the, about personal space, about personal space, well, in the animal literature, in the animal literature, it's not used, per, it's not called personal space, obviously. Uh, but uh, what you see is, and what you see here on this typical little diagram also, is that this space is defined in physical terms. It's a peripersonal space, is the physical distance exp expressed the physical distance metric between that that qualifies the distance that quantifies the the distance between uh, the body and an object in the environment an object on a person uh, of a person in the environment it's the kind this kind of uh, metric expressing what the safety zone is between body and object so it's actually a legitimate question whether social threat influences that physical distance metric and second whether the nature of the uh, whether the, sorry whether social objects influence that metric and second whether social social objects that represent a threat a social threat influence that physical distance now if if this is the case then we have to rev revise our notion of very personal space because that personal space has to be defined inter uh, interactively in ter in terms of the intentions of the uh, of the person or the object vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the organism we are considering. So uh, what we did in this study is use, uh, use a menacing, uh, menacing versus neutral uh, body, uh, uh, body postures. In fact, here there were videos. This is not the optimal image, but uh, it still gives you the idea. We adapted this. Uh, we adapted this scenario. We created this scenario because what we wanted is to be as realistic as possible. On the one hand, to the fact that person that people are actually laying down in the scanner, and also to the fact that in in uh, some countries this this study was conceived in South Africa, uh, this kind of home invasion is is uh, relatively frequent. So we combined the constraints of the scanner with a realistic scenario of somebody actually invading the house when the person is uh, is laying in the bed and watching television. Okay, so that's what you see here. Um, <coughs> we had somewhere on the screen should be. The, uh, we focused attention on a specific spot in the room in order to not have uh, people. Uh, the, the, the TV was positioned right, right in the uh, for the gaze straight gaze direction, so the attention was not on the door. You had a, a menacing person entering the space, as compared to uh, um, a non-menacing, a neutral character, or a child, or or a dog. Okay. Um, these um, these um, we had dark skinned and light skinned people, and uh, we had the child uh, versus here you have a dog and you have a child, 
And as you see, uh, we have two, two conditions that, that triggered, uh, were perceived as threatening, the same to the same extent for the black and the white male, light-skinned and dark-skinned, and both contrasting with a child and with the, with the dog that did not uh, trigger uh, any, any threat uh, experience in the observer. <coughs> what we see here, as in the very first study I mentioned, that uh, we have but, in, but with a <laughs> more pronounced and clear uh, and clear view here that we have the whole uh, peripersonal uh, network including the areas now to be core areas of the peripersonal network but also we have the emotion expression network that were to the same extent uh, um, active in the two fear versus the two uh, non-fear conditions so um, this, um, this again shows how you can, uh, with different materials in different circumstances and in a very, very uh, different design than the previous one, that you can, uh, that you can uh, measure, uh, measure the impact in virtual reality of, uh, of um, aggressive uh, interactions between a person and an avatar. Uh, the areas, the, the areas uh, we find uh, very nice and very, very uh, um, understandable activity in areas that are related to uh, that are related to not only to threat perception but also to how you react to threat perception. For example, a ventral premotor. Uh, and motor areas in general should be involved in how you react to the, and how you prepare your adaptive reaction to threat, not just the experience of threat, of course. So that was, um, so this, this first study, uh, this first new study shows that, um, that even inside this VR, this artificial VR context, we find, uh, we find uh, that uh, the, a peripersonal space network is involved in coding object to body distances. We find we find that area is sent that that coding is sensitive not just to the physical distance, which was the the same object to object to body physical distance was the same for all four conditions, but we have different reactions in that specifically in that network depending on whether the stimulus is or is not perceived to be a social threat. Okay. Now, if that is in, if that is the case, then we can actually conclude that the peripersonal space network and the network that constantly monitors the distance between the the, the organism and the objects in its environment that it codes subjective experience and not just a physical distance from uh, from the body. So this is a much more dynamic uh, dynamic um, monitoring system than just physical uh, physical uh, distance. Okay, so that so much for this study, which um, follows up uh, follows up on the previous one by now adding this the the important information that um, distance net distance to uh, object to body distance monitoring network is sensitive to the nature of the object that. Uh, that uh, good. Um, in the next study, we wanted to do something similar, but also something different. Again, using virtual reality, but this time, this time actually looking into the behavior. So we get closer and closer to. Uh, uh, we add another component of interaction, namely, namely uh, the reaction of one person to the behavior of the other one. Okay. Um, like in the two first studies I mentioned, people were of course passively observing what was uh, what was shown to them. So here we wanted to look into, uh, uh, of course, again the effect of body posture. There's actually a movement should be posture and movement, also of group affiliation and of proximity of virtual encounters, specifically on the human freezing response, because it's very well now, it's, uh, the details are up for discussion, but the general picture is totally, totally clear and, uh, and established that depending on the, depending on the kind of threat, uh, 
people react differently. And that reaction can go from one to two important kinds of reaction in the face of threats, now all through the animal literature and the human literature, but not really the really, really uh, um, studied with VR so far is uh, freezing versus fleeing depending on how close you are to the to the threat what the escape was the possibilities or escape are for the threat for from the threat you will either go into a state towards a state of freezing on the spot or fleeing from the source of uh, the source of uh, so these are of course these are of course physiological and behavior reactions and that's what we wanted to catch in this in this experiment there are um, uh, specific uh, signatures associated with uh, with uh, uh, responses to threat. One is bradycardia. Another one is postural mobility. Uh, and both, uh, both. So when there is a threat, as you see here, you can you can uh, you orient to the threat, but following this orientation, you can freeze on the spot or you can make movements to escape from the spot. And uh, that's what we try to do. This kind of work uh, could not be done uh, before. Uh, something like that has been done, but it was typically done, as you can see here, with the Ekman faces. Uh, so uh, Ekman faces, a face just showing up on the screen. Or it, was, or it was done in something coming closer to what we wanted to do, uh, but still uh, not really the kind of virtual reality we wanted to uh, approximate. It was done like in a shooting game. Uh, somebody points, points either, uh, either um, a gun or a phone at you, so that kind of thing. Okay? So, um, but in, in what those studies found, and again, this is confirmed, the, the rest of the literature and very well known in animal studies, the your freezing, react, <coughs> freezing reactivity to social threat is indicated by reduced heart rate and by changes in, by, by changes in postural mobility. So in this uh, VR scenario, we wanted to see whether we could indeed come close to this kind of, this kind of reaction. <clears throat> As I said, this is uh, uh, we had previously done uh, similar studies in uh, using uh, using in this in this paper together with uh, with Saint Pisson and Julie Grez, We did we used videos. So some of this work was indeed done with, with videos in fMRI, but we could not, of course, create the, create behavior. I mean, people have to lay still in the scanner. We cannot cannot. Uh, can, we could measure heart rate, not, not yet in those days, but uh, now, of course, we do measure systematically heart rate, but uh, we certainly cannot measure any kind of behavior. So uh, <coughs> we, created, we created this situation. Um, of course, with the, uh, Mel has done very well known and very important work relating, relating to, uh, <coughs> to situations with full body illusions, etc. And um, in this specific study, we also used embodiment, but we used embodiment uh, um, in, uh, with the group, I would call it race, uh, race uh, uh, belonging, but with, uh, with uh, group, uh, group uh, affiliation. So we have group, we created group affiliation by using a white skinned or group affiliation by using a black skinned avatar. And we had a couple of different avatars, uh, avatars, uh, um, <coughs> just to make it, uh, to make it, because the problem, of course, is whether or not you you use virtual reality. We do need a lot of a lot of repetitions to be able to measure uh, this kind of thing. Okay, so this uh, this is actually. Uh, um, uh, older studies, but in our situation, this on the right panel here, you see what we have. We had uh, these are uh, dynamic stimuli whereby um, Navatar was approaching the subject of the experiment, uh, coming closer and closer with, uh, <coughs> with different, uh, different gestures, some of which could be menacing gestures. So this is more about, about the design. Uh, about, we had this embodiment on the, on the left side, you see the embodiment face before, and uh, in the middle you see the, the design of the different, uh, <coughs> different conditions and, uh, some, uh, uh, and the various distances, <coughs> far, intermediate and close proximity to the, of, the, of, the, 
avatar in the VR to you as participant. What you see here, uh, you don't see it too well, but here you see the person standing on, on this square thing, which is actually a power platform. You see it depicted here. And that's what I mean in this case by measuring actual behavior, because on this power platform, we can, we can measure body sway. We can measure whether people will pull back or, pull or move sideways or move, move in, the, in, the, in the middle plane in the midline plane. So anterior, posterior and midline plane. So those are minor movements, but it's, uh, it's, they are very systematic movements of approach avoidance uh, behavior also. And of course we can look at, uh, at the heart rate. And here, so what you see here is that the, you, what, you see, what you see on the screen is the, the situation of the avatar approaching. Of that, but the, so the people were standing up in order for us to uh, be able to measure this, uh, this be reactive behavior to, to what they were shown in virtual reality. Good. So here, a couple of results from this study. We... Um, <laughs> some main effects there when embodying a black skinned compared to a white skinned avatar uh, the, the cases where we had a reduced reduced heart rate when facing of course when facing aggressive compared to a neutral looking when facing a black compared to a white skinned and uh, we compared also uh, the avatars in the intermediate and, and the far uh, proximity we do find that um, we do find differences in a baseline heart rate between these conditions as a function of as a function of the um, black versus white skinned avatar and as a function of the aggressive and neutral uh, neutral uh, posture of the avatar <laughs> overall what you see there we have a reduced heart rate when embodying a black skinned body and facing a black skinned avatar, and both have to be there together. <laughs> we have some, uh, we have reduced mobility. So freezing, reduced mobility is an indication of freezing. There is less body sway. Reduced mobility here means uh, less body sway. So we have less, uh, less body sway or reduced mobility in the anterior posterior plane for close compared to intermediate and far avatars when you are embodying a white skinned, uh, when you're embodying a white skinned avatar but not when embodying a, a black skinned avatar. But when faced a, <laughs> faced a black skin, I'm looking to look into, into in more detail, okay? So the res results are a little complicated because of course we have, uh, we have uh, white on white, uh, white on black, black on white and black on black. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, specifically concerned uh, re concerning reduced mobility, we find reduced mobility in the <coughs> in the midline uh, in the midline plane when you're facing a black skinned aggressive avatar while embodying a black skinned body. <coughs> we have increased the opposite, increased mobility in the in the midline plane when you're facing a black skinned aggressive avatar and embodying a white skinned avatar, and that effect was was. Uh, <laughs> predictably uh, stronger for close pro proximity. So uh, we find, uh, to uh, summarize this one here, we find that in a highly ecological virtual reality scenario, social threat as represented by approaching aggressive avatars elicits freezing reactivity, heart rate and mobility in the midline plane. Uh, <laughs> plane. Uh, when proximal threats are inescapable, there is more freezing reactivity as shown by heart rate and mobility uh, in uh, mobility results. We, um, concerning in-group aggression, that is a complicated point of this study because that was uh, not what we had expected entirely. In group aggression, we show that facing a black skinned aggressive avatar while you are embodying a black skinned body is associated with increased freezing response. So we find more, uh, we find more uh, freezing, freezing fear 
reactions when in a black on black and a white on white situation than in a cross uh, group belonging situation. I mean, those are details that don't matter too much for this actual presentation. I'll happy to, I'm happy to send you the paper, obviously. <coughs> so a third study, we uh, wanted to look into something a little bit different, namely, um, what if you are able to control the situation? Uh, so far, I had an, an, a study, I showed you a study of passive undergoing of aggression. I showed you a study where we measure your active reaction to that, uh, which is of course the beginning of controlling the threat. But what if we create a situation where you actually uh, are able to control, the, to control the interaction, for example, by making, by stopping stopping the progression of the avatar by stopping uh, by stopping the um, aggressive avatar from coming close to you so here again in a different scenario we did a vr study this time using uh, eg and or questions or questions were uh, first what are the electrophysiological physiological correlates of perceiving threatening non-threatening body expressions and second, how are these correlations influenced, correlates influenced by the perceived control you have over the social situation? For example, we imagined and we speculated when you have total control that uh, you don't experience fear. When you know, when you know you have total control, um, then there is no reason, there is no reason to experience fear because you can simply stop the avatar from coming close. I mean, these are of course uh, uh, relatively um, interesting questions also for translation uh, into uh, into real life uh, situations so what we did here we created this somewhat somewhat complex i say somewhat rich uh, design of an eg study where uh, people knew whether they were going to be to to um, control the situation. So let me first show here. <laughs> you have, you have first, it begins with a static avatar and then the avatar approaches. But before you get to see that, you get a, a cue about the situation you are going to be in. In 0%, in 0% <laughs> uh, of the, um, of the, when you, when the, when the cue says 0%, then uh, you have no control over the avatar. When, um, and your button press, you, I, I should have mentioned this, this is a situation where you're supposed to press a button when you want to stop, when you want to stop the avatar. Okay? In the, in the zero, when it's zero percent, you can press as much as you want, but the, your avatar, uh, your button press has no effect and the avatar will come closer. That's 25, 50, 75 and 100 percent. 100 percent is a situation where the button press will stop the, stop the avatar. Okay? So, and that this is what you know in advance before uh, before a, a trial starts so you have a situation of maximum uncertainty uh, which is be maximum uncertainty is actually at 50 at 50 percent <laughs> no uncertainty on both extremes and um, and uh, a measure of uncertainty in the two two in between situations we used this experimental setup um, we wanted people to stand up, but that was a little bit difficult because um, that this experiment lasts like over an hour, given all given the conditions and the number of trials we would need for EG. Uh, but, so we used this chin rest and some and a little chair, uh, not a little chair, a little let's say a bar stool. Well, people uh, people were sort of half sitting down sitting a little bit but not sitting not leaning down fully relaxed and we use this chin rest to compensate for the, the weight the weight of the equipment on the, on the subjects <coughs> some some information about about uh, the system we used and that's um, not relevant here so what do we find uh, in these in these conditions across all conditions independently independently of whether you know or not that um, you can stop the avatar from coming close we do find a difference between angry and neutral uh, uh, avatars and this is sort of important and interesting because it fits with the literature that uh, independently of whatever cognitions you have about the situation your emotional reaction is going to be is going to be uh, to be uh, independent of those cognition situations uh, uh, um, reflections you make consciously 
Okay. Which again, uh, underscores the relevance of using virtual reality for this kind of research because it shows that uh, it shows that um, even people are in the even if people are in the comfort in the relative comfort of the lab they know that they are in an experiment on top of that they know that they are facing an avatar that is just a virtual character uh, made made of made of bits and pieces so to speak they still react with a uh, fear <coughs> uh, with a specific uh, specific uh, pattern specific eg pattern to the angry avatar different from their reactions to the neutral avatar okay? and this as i said this underscores the usefulness also of uh, not only do we need this kind of situations in vr to study uh, this um, uh, this behavior, but also in uh, in return, it shows uh, it shows that the very nature of VR, namely suspension of disbelief, is useful for uh, is useful and actually fits fits very closely the type of the type of behavior which we are studying, namely a type of a type of emotional reaction behavior that is indeed independent uh, from people's cognitions and beliefs about the situation. So there is, there is a remarkable fit here between, between what some people would call the constraints of the methodology, namely VR, and the nature of the phenomenon, uh, which we study, namely in both cases, uh, beliefs do not matter for what, we, for what you observe. Um, that's that's less relevant here. That is uh, heart rate, uh, clear heart rate uh, differences between the conditions, and I don't have I don't have time. What you see here is zero to hundred is the control probability and the differences in heart rates and the control probability. But I don't have to time to time to go into that now. Good. <coughs> also, um, also um, the. What, when we look at the theta power on the EG uh, um, measurements, we see that over time, uh, not in the beginning, but over time, uh, control uh, pro um, processes related to control kick in. So to uh, a little summary of this one, um, in virtual reality, like in natural environments, the early stages of threat perception trigger automatic responses in support of the notion that different fear reactions at different uh, stages of threat proximity, threat imminence continuum, there is an the important theoretical background for that, uh, that, we can, that we can measure that. Uh, this also validates virtual reality for various clinical uses. And uh, in turn, virtual reality building, the construction, the architecture of virtual reality environments can be optimized. This is my claim, and you may not agree with it. Can be op virtual reality, uh, <coughs> virtual reality architectures can be optimized through a better understanding of how the brain perceives bodies and interactions. And this brings me to the last part of my talk, where uh, how actually does the brain perceive uh, uh, and perceive and process as bodies? And here, uh, here, that's this is ongoing work in the lab where we try to and um, uh, where we try to understand how the brain, uh, what what the brain uses, what representations of bodies the brain uses in the, in its uh, in its perception of uh, bodies and interactions. Okay. And um, to anticipate to anticipate here. Um, this will bring me to conclude about a different notion, a different view on, on what, what realism means for virtual reality, if, if we get to that. So I shall be brief uh, here. So <coughs> what, we, um, what we wanted to do is get away from the symbolic descriptions of uh, bodies and interactions, uh, which is symbolic uh, is in, in common sense language because the brain doesn't use this common sense, doesn't use this symbolic descriptions. Maybe at, maybe depending on your on your view at the very at the very final output stages, natural language comes in. But natural language we know by now is not going to the use of natural language is not going to help us to understand how uh, the brain process how the brain perceives uh, uh, stimuli. So uh, what we try to do is work on those videos and code 
uh, use uh, computational analysis of the videos and then based on the computational analysis define some features okay uh, and they could be they could be various features i give some example here um, <coughs> they could be kinematic features they could be postural features we also have uh, have independently uh, descriptions uh, and feature analysis based on what observers actually uh, use when they describe the stimuli, but that's a different story, because uh, the, those don't matter. Subjective descriptions of the stimuli, of course, of course, I mean, depends on your view, of course, but do not match computational analysis of the same stimuli. So this kind of work, uh, this uh, this kind of work, we look, uh, we show uh, naturalistic. Uh, um, images in the scanner but on, and then based on that we have on the one hand the computational analysis on the other hand we have brain data and we try to we, this is a way of uh, this is not uh, this is not directly of course a neural network approach but this is um, a, a kind a kind of top-down computational feature extraction approach uh, that merges that merges with, to some extent with uh, network approaches so this is this is simply how those features look hmm. a little bit stuck again yes <coughs> Um, so we have the emotional categories, as I said, the emotional categories are very simple, but we all know that the emotional categories like anger, happiness, neutral or fear, uh, that they, they are not, if you look for the, for, for the place in the brain where anger, happiness, neutral or fear are coded, you will not find it because uh, it's a little bit actually like discussions on consciousness. I mean, the neural, the neural cor correlates of these expressions, much as we recognize them in daily life, their neural co co correlates do not like, uh, maybe at one point, uh, some people told us that it would be the locus of fear and the locus of happiness and the locus of anger, but we, uh, we have uh, walked away from that somewhat, somewhat uh, preliminary uh, uh, view uh, for a while now. So what we, what we uh, try to do is, is um, see how these different uh, features defined over the computational video analysis, how they were possibly related to, uh, related to uh, um, to brain activity. We also, as I mentioned in parallel, I didn't realize that sl slide was actually in there. We also looked at, we also worked with people's ratings. So we had people rate uh, what they see, because of course it's, it's important in daily life. People say, oh, he is angry because, uh, because uh, it, there is a lot of emotional intensity. Or people will say he's angry because it's a, the, the, the <coughs> he moves forward or away, inverted. So we also had those, those subjective, uh, but I'm not going to do that. <coughs> anyway, so we compare uh, those uh, quantified, uh, uh, quantified uh, computational feature descriptions and relate them to the brain activity. And uh, I mean, I'm just going to give one example. Uh, where it's uh, yeah here this is a big overview where you see the different features here <laughs> in relation to the different to the different brain areas which which area might possibly code more than another one for let's say uh, acceleration to take one okay so you see that when you look at at uh, when you look at these different areas and these are the areas in the brain that are that seem to be involved uh, overall in uh, in uh, coding features, you see that these different brain areas co code very differently. Uh, code very differently depending on the kind of feature uh, feature uh, you look at. Uh, if you look at, for example, emotion, which is the emotional uh, category, the the model the model category, you see that you find some some representation of that in frontal areas. Absolutely nothing in premotor or in, in ventral or dorsal premotor. Um, <coughs> uh, anyway, so um, for example, acceleration is coded is coded in these areas. Is absolutely not coded, for example, here or here or uh, or 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 there. It's not it's not coded in the diffuse from body area. That one does not code acceleration. You may conclude, oh, it pro probably codes more posture than movement, but that's uh, that's uh, so. Um, 
when we now look so you this is sort of uh, uh, echoes what I said about about uh, uh, said five minutes before. If you look, uh, you cannot continue looking using those symbolic terms like like anger, fear, or so to see where where in the brain anger or fear would be coded, because you see that anger and fear um, videos. Uh, can be decomposed in a bunch of different features and in turn these different properties of those videos are coded across the brain in a bunch of different areas. So we get to a pretty distributed uh, image of how all this, uh, how all this works. Um, one specific example uh, uh, illustrates my purpose, namely an important one uh, is limb contraction. And when we look at limb contraction, we do see that limb contraction is in fact coded in areas that have been associated with anger. So it's not like a totally different world. The, the world of symbolic descriptions of emotional behavior is not totally, totally remote or unrelated to our computational feature descriptions, because you see here very clearly that we get uh, that we get we get all those areas that are known from the literature to be relevant for anger uh, anger uh, uh, behavior, okay, and for threat, of course. When you see somebody with contracted limbs, uh, it is it uh, tends to uh, tends to uh, reflect a, a situation of anger. Good. So what we do with this kind of work is looking on, on looking looking at uh, feature properties of uh, body expressions as they play a role in interaction. Also, in order to get a more a more detailed uh, detailed view of how uh, the brain deals with uh, bodies in interaction. For, so here. <coughs> we see that uh, we see that the limb contraction plays a central role in fear for body expression perception is differentially represented in action observation, motor preparation, and affect coding in these different areas. Okay. So that gives us an insight in uh, how in what the perceptual features are that possibly drive action and emotion perception. And my uh, uh, what I what I submit now is that virtual realism uh, can be defined. What the re what makes virtual real for the observer and for the participant in experiments, in games, and whatever can best be defined at the level of this mid level at, at the stage of this mid level features, and thereby provides provides a scientific touchstone for what naturalness is and could be. And of course, uh, gives a more a more clear and a more operational tool on what on just how good avatars have to be in order to convey this uh, this kind of this requirement of being realistic. If you want to design an avatar that is that comes across as realistic, it would uh, it would be good that it not has the right clothes or the right or the right or the right. Uh, uh, ratios of uh, of uh, body ratios, but it has to have it has to have the in our case, for example, it has to have this feature of limb contraction. And when it has that, whatever else other characteristics, it will it will come across as uh, as um, an angry as expressing expressing anger. Um, <coughs> we can uh, we are currently trying to move from. Um, um, computer, computerized feature analysis of single uh, of single bodies to to uh, bodies in interaction. This is an experiment we did a while ago before virtual reality, and we are currently working on uh, on doing the kind of work I showed you with the features, but in interaction. And you get this kind of this kind of analysis where you can then, uh, as you can guess, uh, look at uh, at features. Uh, not only at the kinds of features, but also at the synchrony, synchrony, asynchrony between some features and not not between other features, and analyze interactions as a function of that. And this was my last slide, I believe. Thank you very much. Done. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for a really interesting talk. So now. Um, the, the Q&A is open for questions. 
And I think that anyone who wants to ask a question could also, if they wish, be upgraded so we, you can talk directly rather than just uh, write into the chat. So your video and um, sound will be heard. So are there any questions? Actually, I, I'll start off with a question, which is that um, uh, the when you're interacting with virtual human characters, well, when you're interacting with people in real life, you may pay a lot of attention to small changes in facial expression, slight br brush, blushing, um, eye blinking at exactly the right moments, and so on. In, in VR, mostly the VR that we have today, which is available to most people, none of these things exist. Yet, nevertheless, you seem to get uh, results where people respond realistically. Um, what what do you think about that that issue? Um, <coughs> my, my most direct and simple answer would be that there is such a redundancy of of uh, of cues uh, that um, to achieve the same to achieve the same the same reaction and the same goal that uh, absence of a few of them is not going to matter very much. However, uh, if uh, what uh, so. So, but the, the fact that those are blanked out and not represented, that doesn't make a big difference. However, as we have shown in earlier work, if there would be a mismatch, uh, it's better to blank them out than to have them mis mismatched. Like we showed in earlier work, that if there is a mismatch between uh, a facial expression and a body expression, that um, the brain picks that up within 100 milliseconds. So it is better to uh, to underrepresent than to than to over or misrepresent that kind of information. So I would be careful careful in trying to add too much details uh, to uh, to to the avatar. On that, uh, uh, of course, it all depends on what you use, what you want to use it for. And uh, but uh, given the redundancy. And uh, the, it's a little bit like it's a little bit like other aspects of visual perception. I remember a long time ago when we worked the first work with or first studies with bodies, we blanked out the face because we really wanted to know what what happened, what, what reactions were triggered by the body and only the body, not the face. So and afterwards we asked people about the facial expression. They all thought they had seen the facial expression, even if it was like really blanked out. And, so the brain will spontaneously, like in many other uh, uh, circumstances of visual perception, will spontaneously complete the picture, make, make whole by filling in what is absent, consistent, of course, with what, with what is available. Thanks. Yeah, that's very interesting. It also fits in with their own uh, intuitive knowledge that we've had over the years, exactly that, the, the, the Sometimes less is more. Yeah. Um, are, are there other 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 questions? Um, again, I, I do have a, another one. Sorry, it's a bit basic. I, I just missed what you meant. So your point about what makes avatars accepted as real, at least producing realistic responses, yes. was limb con limb contraction. But I yes. I'm I don't know. I must have had a tiny sleep for a second because I missed. What do you mean by limb contraction? You just um, move. Well, when we when we uh, Anna, when we um, coded the when we used the coding of the videos, okay, we uh, one thing we coded was a feature which we call limb contraction, and limb contraction can be operationally viewed as, for example, for for uh, for can be can be measured as the distance between the hand and the shoulder. See. When the distance between your hand and in a video, okay, when the distance between your hand and your shoulder is small, that means your your arm is contracted, right? I understand. Yeah, so is it meant lit, more or less literally limb contraction? Yes. 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 Yeah. These okay. are these are uh, the, yes. These are, this is simply coding uh, <laughs> coding of the values of the of the so you project onto onto your video this framework of 18 18 reference points for the body and then you can calculate uh, whatever relations between every every number of course right 
Yes. No, I think it, it's really important and, and they, it would be very nice to see this kind of generalised, not just to what makes an individual virtual character real, but then apply these same kind of techniques to what makes two people or three people or a group become real so that you respond realistically to the group. Yes, yes. Uh, and you can, of course, measure. I'm going to put that, that one on my screen again because it allows me to clarify that point. Cha, 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 cha. Because the my interaction one, you can, uh, yeah, this one. You can, <laughs> if you have like this and you have coded your two uh, the bodies in your video, you can calculate the relation between, between A lifting up the arm and B stepping backward, for example, right? Yes. And many, and many other, uh, you can, you, you can uh, you, the time it takes, you can calculate the time it takes. So you can, not only the head movements as people have done, I mean, do they, uh, the, uh, if, is there a lot of nodding in synchrony, but you can do much more than your head movements. You can, you can see how the whole body uh, of the one reacts to what the other one is doing. Yes. You can define, uh, I think you have, a, you have a metric for defining successful or, or aggressive interaction. And, and I think this contributes because uh, people who study presence in virtual reality are not aware of this kind of literature, but really what you're doing goes very deep, uh, brain level of understanding what presence is, people responding realistically to virtual scenarios. Yeah. At least here in interaction with others, and I think this uh, this approach is kind of really scientifically quite profound compared with most of the literature in 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 presence. So thanks for introducing that. Are there other questions? Just uh, put your um, using um, reactions. You can put your hand up or just type something into Q and A. Okay, I don't see any other questions at the moment. And um, well, the hour is past. Yeah. So um, thanks very much uh, for, for your uh, really interesting and I think very important talk. And thanks to the attendees and um, well, for, for attending. And also we'll, um, we'll advertise soon when the, the next talk is. And I believe the next one is on the ethics aspects. A virtual reality of the uh, guest XR project. So thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks to you. Thanks to all of you.